I hope you are ready kid, because you are about to go on one hell of a ride. This was what the head of Roulette Records, Morris Levy, told his newly signed artist Tommy James. As his career unfolded, James gradually learned that Levy was connected to the mob and he had unknowingly entered one of the most dangerous record contracts in history. Tommy James was an up-and-coming singer from Dayton, Ohio, and after the success of his single Hanky Panky, he moved to New York to make it big. The first red flag was that when he became a rising star, almost every label wanted to sign him. However, when word got around that Morris Levy from Roulette Records wanted to sign him, every label had mysteriously backed out. According to James, When I signed, I'd taken Hanky Panky to everyone in New York and got a yes. Roulette was the last place. Next day I got calls from all the companies, Columbia, Epic, RCA, Atlantic, and Kama Sutra, and they said, we gotta pass. Nonetheless, Tommy's first years at Roulette Records were incredibly successful, and his band The Shondells were selling millions of records. During his first six years, James sold 23 gold singles and nine platinum albums. And in 1968, James' record sales even outsold the Beatles in the US. Despite the shady aspects of the label, signing to them was highly advantageous. On this label, he was the star and wasn't competing for the label's attention from other artists. If I'd gone to a corporate, I'd have been a one-hit wonder. Roulette needed me because they hadn't had a hit for three years, so they allowed us freedom. We did everything from writing the songs to designing the covers. It was a total education. However, it gradually dawned upon James and the Shondells that this was no ordinary label. We'd start seeing mobsters that we saw on TV. He'd introduce me to somebody and a week later, I'd see the guy on TV doing a perp walk out of a warehouse in New Jersey in handcuffs, saying, isn't that the guy we just met up at Roulette? And little by little, we realized who we were rubbing shoulders with. James was put in an incredibly difficult situation. He was outselling the Beatles, but this was not reflected in his bank account. Instead of a detailed paycheck with a full breakdown of how much he was earning, James was regularly just offered a paper bag full of dollar bills. According to James, they would say, Here's $10,000, kid. Knock yourself out. Music publishing was Levy's biggest racket. He often put his name on the songwriting credit for other artists and collected all of the royalty money. Michael Francis, the former mafia member turned YouTuber, explained, Well, I'll tell you what Morris used to do. He used to fraudulently put his name as one of the writers, one of the songwriters, and he would keep all the publishing. He beat a lot of artists that way, and they were afraid to say anything because it was Morris. They knew his connections. They didn't want to say anything. James knew he was being screwed, but there wasn't much he could do about it. In fact, asking for royalty payments at Roulette Records had devastating consequences. Also signed to Roulette Records was a country pop star called Jimmy Rogers. Rogers got into an argument with Levy and believed he was owed nine years worth of royalty payments from the label. On December 20th, 1967, Rogers was found along the San Diego freeway having been beaten to a pulp with a fractured skull. Thankfully, he was still alive but was permanently disabled afterward. Rogers testified that he was beaten up by off-duty cops, and there were rumors that these cops were on Levy's payroll. Levy was not a member of the mob himself. However, it was common knowledge that his business partner was Tommy Eboli, the boss of the Genovese crime family. Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, who was the model for Tony Soprano in The Sopranos, was another close personal friend of Levy's. Roulette Records was essentially a front for his criminal gang. So James essentially had to keep his head down and his mouth shut. He said, I didn't get any beatings, but plenty of threats and intimidation. You didn't talk about what you knew. Roulette was a social club for the mob. They used it to organize illegal bank accounts and drug deals. Trailers were parked up all day unloading who knew what. I'm trying to have a pop career with this terribly dark and sinister story going on, which could never be discussed. At the same time, James also felt protected. Morris was a likable guy like my father figure, but he was an abusive father. It was great to have him as my protector. Don't mess with me or I'll get Morris. But he was also extremely effing scary. However, in 1971, James' life was in danger. According to James, in 1971, a really horrible gang warfare broke out in New York City. At the time, the Genovese crime family were at loggerheads with the Gambino family, another prominent family in New York. It was right out of The Godfather. In six months, over 300 wise guys got killed. Morris and Nate were implicated and took off for Spain, except they never left New York. With Morris Levy in hiding, it was suspected that they could go after James. Through his successful career, he was Levy's golden goose, and taking him out made strategic sense. James' lawyer told him, You must leave town. 
If they can't get Morris, they'll go after who's making the money, and that's you. James took his lawyer's advice and went to Nashville to work on a country record. In 1972, the Genovese family's acting boss, Tommy Eboli, was killed, and his killing was linked to the Gambino family. James was stuck in his contract at Roulette Records and was simultaneously frightened and fascinated by Morris Levy. Levy and James were close friends, to the extent that Levy told him how he killed a guy who gunned down his brother and showed zero remorse. One time, Levy, James, and others at the label were doing drugs, and James finally plucked up the courage to ask Levy a question that had been eating away at him for years. Roulette Records was a successful record company. If anything, it didn't need mob affiliations. If anything, they were harming his company. James simply asked Levy, why do you hang out with these people, the mob? They scare everyone at the company. Artists won't bring you their master tapes because they're so afraid. This was a dangerous question to ask, but Levy simply laughed and said, tell you the truth, Tommy, these are the guys I came up with off the street. I've known them all my life. It's all I know. As well as robbing royalties from other artists, Levy was involved in a number of other scams. One of the most genius frauds involved selling counterfeit CDs by artists from other labels. The other labels did not know who was selling these counterfeit records, so they called Levy, who they knew was affiliated with the mob, to deal with this issue. So they paid Morris Levy to clamp down on whoever was counterfeiting their products, not knowing that it was Levy who was counterfeiting these records. Another one of Levy's scams involved filing plagiarism lawsuits against other artists. He sued John Lennon for plagiarizing the Chuck Berry song You Can't Catch Me with the Beatles hit Come Together. Levy won and John Lennon gave him the rights to some of his own unreleased recordings as a settlement. However, John Lennon's record label Capital countersued Levy and ended up winning the case. According to James, Levy could have easily killed John Lennon years before Mark Chapman did in 1980. It was very bad. Capital had a shit fit, but that didn't bother Levy. He didn't care for reputation or person. He had such balls, Lennon could easily have ended up in the East River. That was a rare defeat for Morris, because he worked publishing. He was smart. He ripped everyone off. In the mid-1970s, James' run of hits had run out, and because his label was owned by a maniac, he became incredibly paranoid. According to James, I bought a 22 pistol, a 25 automatic pistol, a Browning 22 Magnum machine gun, a Marlin 22 with an octagon barrel, and a 32 caliber police pistol with an 8 inch barrel. I stockpiled ammunition, I started carrying a gun every time I went to the studio, I was also seeing a psychiatrist. It was through attending Levy's parties that James learned that he couldn't simply go to the police. He said, All the mob guys were there, plus everyone from the mayor's office the police commissioner, and the city councilors. Funny thing was, despite the crazy stuff they did, the mob guys were pretty conservative. There weren't a lot of broads coming out of cakes, just a lot of palms being greased and a lot of shoulders rubbed. Alongside his accountant, James looked into how much royalties he was owed. They visited a pressing plant that printed up his records and counted the number of records they pressed. They tallied it all up, and James was owed between 30 to 40 million dollars. He presented this information to Levy and was kindly told, F you, if you ever try and use that against me, you'll find yourself in the effing river. Nonetheless, James was proud of the fact that he stood up to him. For once, I stood my ground. I didn't know whether I was going to leave his office alive, but I was so high on uppers I didn't really care. We flung each other against the wall and I told Morris, go F yourself for the last time. In 1975, James left Roulette Records. I was still in contact with Morris, but I wasn't giving him hits. 11 years later, he offered me my own record company. What do you want, kid? I'll give it to you. I admit, I was tempted. That's the hold he had. It wasn't until 1986, two decades after signing to Roulette, that Tommy James would receive his first royalty check from Roulette Records. However, this check did not come from Levy. Around this time, Levy had been indicted for racketeering and sold Roulette to EMI. Despite the fact that it was now owned by a legit label, he did not receive his missing money. Vast sums were still owing, which I didn't see. But although it ate me up, I'm glad I didn't get the money. I might have destroyed myself. 40 million in the 80s? In 1990, Levy was sentenced to 10 years in prison. However, he died from throat cancer before he could serve his sentence. In 2010, James released his autobiography, Me, the Mob, and the Music. Rather ironically, it was his amazing tale of being scammed out of millions by the mafia that made this book a bestseller and helped him claw back some of the money stolen from all those years. Make sure to subscribe for more.